Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Global Networking Week, uh, our finance session. Uh, we are pleased today um, to be joined by a fabulous alumna who um, uh, I will let uh, Anna talk about uh, her background, but my name is Leonard Williams. I work with Career Wave programs here at the university and I will uh, be learning uh, just as much as you all. Um, we're going to have a short presentation from Anna and then uh, we will open it up to Q&A. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to uh, share ahead of time, just use the chat feature um, to provide your questions there and then we'll call on you once we get to Q&A um, for you to ask your question directly. But I will turn it over to Anna so that we make the most of our uh, 60 minutes and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Leonard. I am so excited to see you all today. Thank you for taking some time out of your schedule to learn more about the industry and the job front. I am admitting people in as I see them, by the way. I just realized that my name um, says Anna C. Team Tony, so I might as well just share a little bit about myself. I volunteer with Tony Robbins and uh, we do our Zoom conferences and personal development and I apparently forgot to change my name. So just a little bit about me. Um, thank you all for being here again. Let me run through a little bit of my um, history. Okay, second slide. So, as Leonard said, I'm a Tulane alumni, and I graduated with a BSM in 2004, then stayed for my NFIN one year in um, 2005. After that, I went into a Wachovia Securities in corporate investment banking, was an investment banking analyst for the Energy and Power Group. And then I went to business school in Spain to get my MBA because I wanted to get international experience and learn a different language. Um, after that, I went to an energy company, worked in the treasury group for a few years, but decided I really missed banking. So I went back into investment banking at BBVA where I've been for the last six years. So I can share a little bit about life at BBVA. I was in CIB for four years and moved to HR so I'm in talent acquisition for CIB now at BBVA. So I'm in an interesting position to talk to you guys about two sides of the banking and career um, industry. So with that, let's get into it. Let's see, Zoom is slow today, but we're having a positive attitude now. All right, so. If you do have my slide deck uploaded yesterday, um, I wanna share a little bit about how COVID affected the industry. So banking was really safe because not much has been affected by COVID luckily. Um, before the pandemic broke out, we had, most banks had a huge initiative to move into more digital structures. So investing in digital technology, making banking more digital because, and, um, serving people instead of coming to the branches like uh, in a more comfortable way at home to reach more people, more, um, more products um, to regular retail customers. So that's kind of how the banking industry um, was heading before the pandemic. Afterward, um, it was basically a smooth transition for most banks. Most banks are not really opening up um, this year anyone that comes into the bank are most likely going to be traders because they have um, very complex trading technology um, at the bank that is a little bit easier to use and more screens than um, if you were at home. So that's kind of how people are moving back, um, back into most of the banks. We have the issue now of reimagining the open space environment. Um, most of banking industry has a kind of an open space environment to facilitate communication, have more people um, in the building together, more uh, kind of an integrated approach, a flat hierarchy in an agile environment. So most of us had an open space or cubicle environment. And now with the pandemic, we are um, forced to reimagine how that's gonna look like, how are we going to separate them um, and what we're going to be doing in the future. So right now, most banks are going through a phased um, in approach for its employees. As for customers, um, what I found, and I talk to bankers every day because I work with the managers um, in their hiring, and um, I also coach them, they, 
Their biggest issue is maintaining a relationship with the customer because banking is influenced by the customer relationships and how you can build trust with them. So we're forced to be able to be more flexible to maintain that connection virtually without taking them out for um, you know, dinners or um, entertainment outings and things like that. Um, we're, we're forging a more intrinsic connection, a more um, solid connection that is built on the personal relationships, the trust in the banker, the knowledge of their products rather than you know, entertainment. And I think that's a much more holistic approach, a much more sustainable approach. And I think generally that's going in the right direction. So, um, and also improving empathy between bankers and customers is really important as well, and bankers um, and their team members. So COVID has really influenced banking in a, in a very positive way. So what about the employees? Well, employees all work from home and a lot of us love it. Um, it gives us more freedom to um, maintain our schedules and um, more less time for travel and more time with family. Um, you know, there has been little loss of productivity and revenue in the banking industry um, with people working from home because there, is, there was quite a seamless transition between working in the office and working from home. Um, the problems that we're encountering, well, a lot of banks are encountering is onboarding new people um, that have never been in the bank and met all of the people in person. So onboarding new hires um, virtually, but we're handling it quite well because a lot of people are kind of reimagining their thinking so that they can connect um, and, and how can we use virtual technology to connect in the same way. So there are a lot of pros and cons from working at home. Something I've seen, um, some have seen an increase in working hours because people think, oh, because you're at home, you, you know, you can't really, we know where you are, so we can call you at any time, you know, so that kind of gives people a different incentive, like what do we need to do to um, redefine this working process boundaries, where can I put in boundaries? How can I best serve the client still from working at home? I mean, and some people really like this more flexible thing and they'll, they'll answer the phone whenever um, they get it. So it just, it, it's forcing us as employees to really look at how we work together and how we interact and um, what, you know, what types of things make us work the best. Like for introverts like me, I love working from home. Um, I really, really enjoy the peace and quiet and um, the ability to be close to family um, and to not have that commute time. So with that, I wanna move into something that's really, really important for us at BBVA in particular and most banks um, at the moment, and that is diversity. I'm gonna start talking while the slide um, gets there because it usually takes the time to get there. But basically, I clipped out a quote from Forbes and it's, um, it's all about how, how diversity brings in more productivity and revenue for everyone. So adding diversity to your workforce is, is basically a win-win because you get so many differences in, um, in experiences and in cultures and backgrounds. I mean, um, working with people from all over the world is, is very rewarding. And I remember moving to Spain, I was able to realize that in such a way that made me grow so much more. And um, oh, finally, it's here. So we also have a higher revenue due to innovation, new ideas from different experiences and different backgrounds. I mean, diversity is the key to the company's bottom line. So any company, whether you're a bank or a tech company who doesn't really embrace the whole diversity um, kind of um, aspect of life and of corporate life is really going to um, fall back because uh, there is, it's all win-win, you know, and, and a lot of people talk about diversity and inclusion. I, I call it diversity and integration because it's all about just integrating all different types of people in our workforce, in our culture, and making sure we're all operating as one team. Let me just check on time. Perfect. So um, a little bit more about diversity. Lately, I felt like it's been, it's been very politicized in that you know, diversity is more than just gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, so much more than that. Um, diversity as a, an idea is extremely important because it also encompasses who you are, you know, accepting people for who they are. There are also introverts, there's extroverts. There are people 
if you look at like psychological stages of consciousness, there are people um, more, you know, in spiral dynamics there's blue mean. So they're very like law and order-ish. Um, they like structure. And then there's people that are more entrepreneurial meritocracy. And then there's people that are more like, uh, um, you know, socially oriented. Uh, those are all structures and levels of consciousness. So, I mean, diversity encompasses so much more than what we're just looking at. You know, veterans, military, um, people from all different backgrounds. So for me, diversity is more than just um, ticking the boxes. It's really integrating and encompassing everyone, all different stories, encompassing everyone's stories into the company to get the best company that we can be. And diversity comes from culture. So everyone is responsible for culture. You know, um, our culture at BBVA, we're all about one team, thinking big, putting the client first. So one team, you know, really integrating everyone and all their stories, um, all different diverse backgrounds into one team. It's a decision that everybody must embody and should be supported by management buy-in. So the top level management really should be looking at this and walking the walk and showing that they are on board with these diversity initiatives. And how do we do that? Well, we have very many different data-driven approaches. So we use our systems to show the current breakout of teams. Um, and we use keyword searches to really search out people with different backgrounds. And I'm admitting people into my room, so apologize for the little um, keystrokes. And we also have a diversity recruiter that explicitly looks for diversity um, and funnels it to us. But of course, in my job, um, on a day-to-day, -day, I'm looking for diversity as well. And diversity is, in a, is more than just awareness. It's, like I said, it's a decision everyone must embody. And I have this quote here that says, awareness without self-reflection is worthless. Um, just because you have the awareness is not enough. It's also looking into yourself and seeing how, how is this affecting me? What does this mean to me? How am I going to change? And what new person do I want to reflect out into the world? So um, diversity is actually very, very, um, it's, it's like, um, it's an upgrade and, and I love it. I can't think of a better word right now to say that, but you know, it's basically upgrading you and, um, and your self-reflection. So the last slide I wanna talk about while it piles up is basically what do you need to do um, to work at a bank or at BBVH? Just some really quick 60 second advice. So when you get to the slide, it will say, it really depends on the culture of the bank. So if you're looking for a job, especially in investment banking, um, you're going to want to look at what culture the bank um, is proposing. So for us, one team thinking big, putting the client first, we're very entrepreneurial. And also different banks, um, it really depends on if it's an American bank versus a European bank or a Japanese or Asian banks. Um, they all have different levels of different types of cultures. Like for instance, a lot of European banks also have to interact with their corporate offices in Europe. So that has a, an additional level of complexity and level of diversity um, that you have to kind of um, look at that American banks don't have because they have their corporate offices in the States, so it's less complex. Um, some typical things that we look for for investment banking is have a really ambitious personality, have a proactive personality, um, to look at um, the problems that you're getting in systemic terms, like what, what all affects this problem that I'm looking at and what resources do I have? Being a team player, you know, interacting with and knowing all different um, members of your team. And I'm like pressing this to make the slide go. I'm not sure why it's not coming up. Oops. Here it is. Okay, perfect. So every bank has a different culture. We're looking for ambitious, intelligent, strategic people, proactive people, flexible, and working as a team. And of course, banking in general, um, as opposed to other industries, and I've only worked in energy, but banking is very, very professional. Um, they expect everyone to be responsible, dependable, and a good example for others. Um, you know, if there's a due date, the stuff needs to be done, like by that due date. And if you don't understand it, um, being really communicative about your questions. Um, and BBVA in particular, we're really, really big on coaching 
integration of the groups and flat hierarchy. So if you have a really good way of doing things, being open and sharing it with others is something we really, really value. And the last thing I want to touch on for the last 15 seconds is something really, really important, and it's the six human needs, and it's basically what motivates everyone. And this is kind of a key I want to share with you when you're looking for a job. So every human is really driven, according to this theory, every human is driven by six human needs. First one is certainty. So basically that you're standing on a solid ground and the ground's not going to collapse under you. That's how certainty you have. Everyone has that variety. Working on different things every day, significance, which is how important do you need to feel? How recognized do you need to feel? Connection, which is connecting with your team. Growth, which is like personal growth and contribution. What are you contributing to the greater good? What are you contributing to your company? So what I found is that people who operate and who are driven by the top two, the last two needs, which is growth and contribution are really going to be very, very successful because they're driven by something greater than themselves. So um, that's something that, that I particularly look at um, when I'm interviewing and, and when everybody's interviewing others, like what really drives them, what motivates them, what's gonna keep them happy. And so that's just kind of a tidbit I wanted to share with you. And with that, I'm gonna end this presentation. Um, I'm really excited to answer any questions you might have. And uh, I think that's it. Yeah, the career site is on the bottom and it's also in the, in the presentation. So if you wanna look at our current careers on the bottom of the website. That's Great. it, I'll turn it back over to Leonard. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, so I just sent a message out uh, and I think, uh, let me stop your sharing there. Okay, Gavin uh, has a question. So Gavin, go. I'm gonna unmute you, uh, go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for taking the time today. I just wrote down two questions, but the main question I had was, what has been your most challenging part of working at an investment bank? Well, that's a great question. Um, I would say not knowing, not being able to plan things. Uh, when I started working in transactions, uh, you never know when you're going to get a new transaction or what you have to do. And it's really a team effort. So um, you, it's not about abandoning your team. So sometimes I had friends actually come in from Norway for vacation and we got a new deal on Friday afternoon. And I had to spend the entire weekend at the bank working on that deal because the deal comes first and I couldn't see my friend. So that's part of the reason why I actually got out of it um, into HR. I, I mean, I love investment banking so much, but the thing that the hardest thing about it was not having control of my schedule and talking about the six human needs certainty was a huge uh, motivator for me. So I needed that certainty and I was honest with myself and I said, I need to find a career where I can have more certainty. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. All right, uh, Anna, we had two questions that were in the session Q&A, um, and I'll ask the first one since it came earlier. Uh, what do you think will drive further investments in cleaner energy technologies, considering your uh, experience in the energy sector? That's a great one. Um, so I know, I don't know about other banks, but banks if they're really on the edge of what's going on in the world and what's going on in the news they'll know that um, the money is where this clean energy is and not just where the money is it's also great for the planet so um, having top management buy-in and having them understand how important this is to make these types of investments is really the first thing and the key thing to do because everything is really driven by uh, the strategy um, within each department of the bank. Like for instance, corporate investment banking, we're definitely um, looking at more sustainable deals, green bonds and um, different forms of energy investments that are uh, more like alternative energy investments. And with that, you, you also have to look at the energy group. So we have an energy group within the investment bank um, and it's just the types of customers that they have, the types of clients and deals that they have um, if, if they want to look at more alternative investment, alternative energy companies to do transactions with, that would be very important as well. Did I answer your question? Uh, I, I think so. Sense? Yeah, it was, a, it was on the session Q and A. So that was, okay. uh, 
uh, Shimal that asked uh, Shamal that asked that uh, question earlier. So we have one other question um, that's also on the session Q and A, and I think this uh, relates a lot to uh, a lot of your roles, uh, both as a Tulane alum alumna as well as in HR. So the question from Melissa was. Um, the CEO of a major bank today said that the limited pool of black talent is to blame for not reaching diversity goals. Um, what can the Tulane Alumni Network do to uh, try and address this? Yeah, um, so I believe that what you focus on grows. And if you focus on the idea that, oh, you can't find this talent, it's, you're not going to find it. You have to focus on, hey, I'm going to find this. This is important for me. That's the first thing you should do is mindset. Um, with that, we do have a diversity recruiter, and I would probably recommend um, whoever the people are interested to get in touch with me. Um, I look for diversity every day, and that's top on my focus list um, because I know how important it is, and um, connecting with the diversity recruiter as well. Uh, so just getting your feelers out there, you know, um, if you're looking for a job, just just know that, like, focus on it every day and ask yourself what more that I can do today to find somebody else, to find a new connection. Um, what can I do today? Just one thing. I would focus on one thing every day to reach out. What can you do to reach out to find a new connection? I'm a connection. There's a diversity recruiter as well that I can hook you up with. Um, and just finding and, and sharing the importance of, you know, being able to share your different stories and having different diverse people on the team, knowing why that's profitable for everyone. I mean, banks and a lot of corporations, they like to speak the language of money. Uh, me having worked in also coaching in HR, I also speak the language of holistic integration. So I also know how important it is for, to make everyone feel like they can be themselves. And that's, you know, I think where the world is going. Great, do we have any, uh, any any additional questions from um, from our audience? Otherwise, I'll just start uh, asking stuff off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, I, I have one more question, if that's all right. Sure, yes. go ahead. Perfect. Um, what has been your favorite or most fulfilling experience in your career? May specifically in investment banking, I, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, probably being able to give advice to top management on on financial transactions. Um, I have a lot of them. Um, in investment banking, that would be my my favorite my favorite favorite aspect. Like sh being able to show the numbers and to show why it's important and have them listen to me. Um, I guess more specifically on my favorite aspect in my whole career um, in an this is in HR actually in investment banking, but I really, really love talking to managers and um, being able to show them resources that they never had. Like a, a lot of times managers come to me and they, they're very stressed out um, and I'm able to get them to question what they used to think and to expand their thinking into encompassing more resources that they never had, being able to connect with their team members in better ways and bringing up the talents of everybody. You know, um, it just lights me up to know that um, people are being nicer to each other, more um, like coaching people to produce more, to be more productive and happier in their jobs. I think if that were the, and tangentially, I do work with investment bankers like that, but in my investment banking career, like I said, I, I just love to advise people. And I think that um, kind of transfers into my HR role as well in CID. Sweet, thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. No problem. All right, uh, Ken has a question. Okay. I'll Go ahead. Speak it. That's pretty good, yeah. So yeah, so I'm just wondering, um, what, what does leadership development look like? Maybe the, the maybe as someone transitioned from an onboarding as a new employee to what might they expect at five and ten years as they develop in a in a banking environment? And specifically, you can speak to BBVA, right? Okay. Yeah, I was about to ask you. Would you uh, were you thinking about BBVA specifically or um, in general? So I'll talk about both. I guess um, is that what you wanted or? Perfect. Okay. So um, different banks not only have different cultures, but they also have different career progression 
So what I found is a lot of American banks, they are on a more laddered approach. So they have the standard two year as an analyst, one year as a senior analyst, then you go to business school for two years, and then you come back for three years as an associate, and then you move up. Um, but what I found is that other banks, international banks, especially the ones with hubs in other countries, they have smaller teams. And with smaller teams, it's less um, possible to move up in a more laddered approach. And so it, with that, um, the career progression becomes more of your responsibility. And that just means like, can you, can you develop yourself and really know your skills to know where you should be and how much you want to learn uh, for yourself? And, and I also know that career progression not only um, is determined by your individual performance, but also the performance of the team that you're on and the bank. So sometimes if the team is not performing well, there will be less opportunities to move up in that moment or if the bank is not performing well, um, or if you are not performing well. And, and with BBVA in particular, there are a lot of opportunities, and I think this is why it's so great. Um, we really encourage people to look around the bank because once you work at BBVA, you have the knowledge, you have like human um, capital in knowing everybody and the way we work and to know um, also our groups abroad in Spain or Mexico and everything like that. So um, if you know yourself and are very self-aware and know what you want, you know, there's many opportunities to move. And sometimes, like I said, the teams can be smaller. Sometimes there's an opening in another team that you're tangentially interested in. So um, I'm going to admit somebody really quick. Um, so you can move into that team and, and might, you might be able to jump um, quite high with that movement. So it's really about looking at opportunity and uh, knowing where you are and what your talents are and what you want to see in your career. So really owning your career. Like for instance, for me, I moved from global trade finance to HR because I, you know, I, I love coaching and I love all those kind of things, but also because I wanted more responsibility. Thank you. So your question, great. Um, Anna, we had a, a session Q and A uh, question um, given where we are with um, with um, everyone working virtually um, and particularly being hired virtually, how how can one be successful in virtual interviews? And if you can share one, you don't have to say the person, but share a, a horrible experience that you had, so we'll know not to do that uh, in the future. And. I think I, oh. you kind of broke up a little bit. Uh, um, I think you asked me to share a great example and a, a learning experience example from a, a virtual interview. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I guess let me start with some great tips on how to conduct um, really good virtual interviews. So for me, um, I feel that being authentic and honest is the first thing you should lead with and more so than preparing some kind of questions that we'll know whether they're canned or not and we'll know whether you know you um, just they're not you it's better to just be really real and authentic and what you want and do some research and self um, self-examination beforehand and what types of career why you want this job why uh, you looked for this company so know about the company, about its culture and about what it's doing, you know, just based on the news or if you want to look at the 10K as well and know exactly why you're getting into investment banking, know about it, um, know the different parts of the bank and what drives the revenues and things like that before you come to an interview. Um, and be able to express very clearly um, the answers to the questions and very succinctly. What I've seen a lot of people do is um, ramble on and on um, for the answers. So, and then they get into a different topic. And um, that, that um, restricts the time I have to, to ask questions that I need to ask. Um, and then often the interview ends late. Um, but yeah, those are just some, some tips. A great interview I had, I guess, just, it, it just came together really it flowed together. 
Um, I didn't have to worry about what I was going to ask next. All, I mean, I asked the same questions to everyone, but it's definitely different when the questions just come out naturally and in a correct flow of conversation rather than um, it, it's very staccato and you have to think about which question you're going to position next and everything like that. So um, definitely being yourself and knowing what you want, being succinct. And a learning experience example, oh man, it would probably be someone who talks about themselves a lot without showing interest in the job or the company. Um, somebody who showcases themselves in a non-self-aware type of way, like a I mean, I guess you can tell whether someone really knows their strengths and weaknesses and somebody who is really pumping themselves up and and not giving you a word of anything in the conversation, not letting you ask the questions because you just keep on talking about yourself, you know, um, and just not asking about the job. So that that's a red flag when, when they don't ask about the day-to-day -day of the job because that's really important to know to see if it's a good fit. Great, thank you. Um, I, I, I will, and again, if anyone has a question, you can either post it in the session app or through the chat through Zoom. Um, since, you know, the majority of our attendees are alumni and at various stages of their career, uh, careers, um, if someone were looking to kind of make that transition into banking from some other industry, what, what kind of should be their game plan if you were to outline it for them coming in as an experienced hire? That's a great question. I actually had to do that uh, when I was in energy and I, I came back to banking. This is what I did. So after work, every day at work, I would research the trends in banking and I would um, take courses online on breaking into investment banking. One of the, my favorite websites to look at was mergersandacquisitions.com or actually it's called Mergers and Inquisitions and it's called Breaking Into Wall Street. Those, that's the company. I purchased a lot of online courses on just to refresh my modeling skills, like advanced, advanced modeling, creating pitch books and stuff because outside of banking, when I first started into banking, I, I learned all of these Excel shortcuts, PowerPoint shortcuts, and formatting things to um, create pitch books, uh, very detail-oriented and on time, that I had forgotten. So I took the class again. I, um, I learned all those shortcuts, and I learned how to, to be very attentive to detail, because in banking, one of the most important things that um, people need to do is be really, really attentive to um, everything because every single number and every single pitch book is going to be very important. And let me tell you, if you get it wrong, you might get yelled at. I mean, I try to tell the managers don't yell anymore. I haven't seen this happen at BBVA, but definitely in the old school investment banking, there, there's a lot of yelling if you don't put a period on your slides. So um, definitely have that attention to detail, take the modeling classes, um, look online to see the industry trends and talk to other bankers that you know, um, cultivate a network, um, talk to them and ask them what it's like working in their company and what is the culture like and what's important for them? What is their bank focused on? Um, where, where are they going in the future? What is the career progression like? Because it's different for every bank. And the culture is different for every bank. And it's really important that if you target a bank to know their culture and to know what's important to them, it's just like knowing, getting to know a person. <laughs> that's, that's my phone and, and that's Justin Trudeau assuming that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yes, uh, definitely targeted approach. Have a targeted approach and talk to people in banking and know the trends. Okay, Maggie has a question. Go ahead, Maggie. Oh, oh, oh! Hi, Anna. Uh, hi. So, here is that. What are some of the current trends that's in, uh, in banking, and specifically healthcare and pharmaceutical industry? I mean, obviously COVID, but uh, I'm very curious that how, because I just saw a lot of mergers are happening. You know, big farmers are buying uh, smaller companies, things like that. Just curious to hear about your thoughts. That's a great question. Um, I honestly wish I could answer that. 
Uh, and only I can't because I've never worked in the healthcare pharmaceutical industry in banking. And I know that's very, very specific. So I don't want to kind of um, talk too much of the current trends in that as I don't want to mislead. But I can guide you to um, look at, you know, different industry publications on that or your, um, or your friends and associates in the pharmaceutical healthcare industry in banking. But um, I saw your question I'm reading again, um, how to successfully start a venture philanthropy. Is that like um, starting kind of a nonprofit or an LLC or a business? Uh, yeah, because uh, there's a, uh, uh, I think the most successful model is a system. Uh, yes. There's a fibrosis foundation. They oh. currently $4 billion in, in investing, you know, uh, and it, they just have tons of money to spend on curing this one disease. Uh, and uh, I, I thought this was a fascinating story. My own background is with, uh, is in medical genetics, very science oriented, but this is something that I'm very interested in to venture into later on in my career. Uh, so just uh, want to see the finance uh, 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 perspective. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So um, I wish I knew more about that, but I'll tell you what I do know. Um, I do know that every state has different laws um, with regards to nonprofits and starting your own business. Um, like for instance, Texas has very favorable laws on, on LLCs. I would probably talk with a, um, a lawyer on the different you know, laws on starting different types of businesses, what corporate structure you want to use. If you want to use like a, I don't know, a, um, an an, a corporation incorporated LLC, LLP, you probably don't want that. Um, you know, sole proprietorship, diff just different tax structures and different, um, corporate structures and, and exactly what you want to do. Yeah, talk to a lawyer, talk to an accountant um, and learn the different uh, laws in your state. That's all I can really add to that. I, I don't have that much experience in starting my own you know, healthcare business. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. So, Hi, Anna. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for this presentation. Very informative. I just want, I'd like to follow up on my question about the virtual interview. So today I got an interview invitation from one of the top two investment banks uh, in Lower Manhattan. And uh, the, it's, uh, the, vir the virtual interview is going to be recorded questions, so without human interaction. So I wonder for, uh, for a diversity program for militants, do, am I going to expect the pretty, pretty much similar behavior questions as usual as ordinary applicants or it's the question is going to be more tailored for militant uh, for service members with uh, military experience and um, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So I, I just want to make sure I understand the question. So um, you're asking you have an interview with some New York investment banks and uh, their questions are are recorded questions and uh, um, they, they're going to be military questions or? Uh, uh, what well, no, the, the program I got the invitation was for, is for a diversity program for militants. So I wonder the questions, would the questions uh, be different from the ordinary applicant, uh, applicant questions? And uh, how is the diversity program uh, going for us? Thank you. That's a great question. So every, Every bank will have different diversity initiatives and every interviewer will have different questions. So just because I'm in HR um, at BBVA, this absolutely does not mean I'm gonna be asking the same questions as HR and sent in there or something like that. So um, I really couldn't tell you what types of questions they would ask. Um, I'm sure I, I would just, the best way to get ready for that is to make sure you have, you know, a sharp suit, um, good color, um, like shirt that really pops. And yeah, th these are other comments I forgot to include on the other question I got on how to ace a virtual interview. I forgot to even talk about, um, you know, aesthetics, but um, 
also continuing to your question. Yeah, I really can't tell the questions that they're going to ask, but my best advice would be just to know yourself and to know um, what values that you have to add to the company, especially when it comes to those types of diversity initiatives and what you can do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, kind of, again, bringing it back to HR, where where do you find yourself if you were looking at applicants, particularly experienced applicants, and you were kind of the, the first few things that you're really looking at that, that may key into whether you would invite that applicant for an interview or, or maybe pass on them? Okay. Um, well, that depends on, on what the person wants, uh, what the manager wants in his or her position. Um, hold on. So um, before, when I recruit for any position, I talk with the manager and I, I talk with them and I ask, what's, what's the main goal of this position? What does the candidate have to accomplish to be successful in the first year? You know, um, what qualities does this person must exude um, in order to be successful in your team? What's the team dynamics? And of course, we look at all the data on um, you know diversities in the team and, and things like that. Um, but I take I usually take a few key words that the manager is looking for, like uh, what types of skill sets does the person have to have? Like for instance, some of them need licenses. So I search out, you know, maybe they need a series seven or series 63, definitely put that out. They definitely need to have that on their resume. And a lot of the positions I look for, they need to be bilingual in Spanish in particular. I'm sure other banks will need, you know, bilingual in, in something else perhaps. Um, so I, I need to look for that bilingual in Spanish. And if I like somebody, I'm going to reach out to them and ask, are you bilingual? Like, what's your level of Spanish? And, uh, you know, because that's a job requirement. So you have, you have certain aspects of the job that are exactly required, like five to seven years FX trading experience. So if I see somebody with um, five to seven years rates experience, well, that's not exactly FX. So I have to keep on looking for FX. Um, and if I see somebody with those exact qualities, five to seven years FX experience, bilingual in Spanish, has a series seven and 63, then I'm going to call them, you know, for instance. Or if I can't find somebody and you know, um, and also keeping into account diversity initiatives too. If you see some keywords on the resume, then, you know, they were in certain leadership functions or they were in the military or something like that. And in most diversities, you can't really tell because diversity encompasses more than things you can see, um, you know, things like that. So I really, I focus on the absolute requirements of the job and do they have those things? And if they don't, um, if I can't find anyone with all the job um, requirements, which I've never encountered before, then I would look at skills that are transferable. So five to seven years of rates experience, I'd reach out and say, well, you know, rates works closely with FX. Um, what do you know about FX? You know, just to kind of probe to see um, what, what level of experience that they have there. Okay, great. Um, so I think we have time for maybe a couple more questions. If anybody uh, wants to jump in, certainly go ahead. Um, and I just want to add that usually if you don't get a call from HR or a recruiter um, and you apply, it usually means that they have selected somebody with, um, you know, the exact um, things that they're looking for for that particular role. And since they've been talking with the manager, they have kind of um, more detail on the role. Um, and also they work in the company. So a lot of people ask me that. They're like, oh, well, why didn't I get a call back? But, but you will get an answer you know, from the company. You will, you will get probably an email or a phone call and say like, hey, it didn't work out because you know, we selected someone with these qualities. So don't be discouraged. That's all. A lot of people ask me these questions like, or, or they tell me, oh, I never got an email back from like five other banks I applied to. I'm like, well, sorry, you know, like, but I'll send you one. <laughs> well, talking specifically about uh, about BBVA, what um, have they shared any um, short term or long term plans regarding hiring, or is it is it flat? I know that earlier you said that that certainly there hadn't been that much of effect, but um, you know, how, what is the hiring out, uh, uh, 
outlook uh, right now, specifically there? Um, well, specifically at BBVA, uh, we're a bank that we really love to take care of our employees. And that means that um, we're not quick to fire, you know? So we're really, when we make our hiring plans, we're very, very um, thoughtful about it. And we have the person's future um, in mind and everything like that. So um, that being said, every single department within the bank will have different plans, you know, like the retail group and the wealth management group will have different plans. The commercial banking group will have different plans. Uh, CIB has different plans and our, in particular, our uh, group CIB is really, really close to, or corporate investment banking, is really close to um, the mother office in Spain. So we're really intertwined with their plans as well. Um, that being said, our offerings on the career site is what we have in store. And when we put a position out, it's because we mean it. You know, we want somebody there. Uh, we've, we've given it a lot of thought. Um, and it really depends on how different groups are performing. I mean, for instance, right now we have an FX trader, um, a, an FX salesperson, and we have a credit trader um, position open. So um, we're really looking into expanding those teams. Great. Well, I would remind everyone to um, certainly, if you have additional questions, uh, post them in the session Q and A. Um, you know, for the next couple of days, we'll still be. Uh, checking that um, and we'll obviously forward those on to Anna. Thank you so much um, for this afternoon and for sharing your time with us and uh, I hope that everybody uh, gets in touch with you. Uh, I'm sure you're on LinkedIn and Tulane Connect and all of that. Yeah, definitely. I'm seeing some questions in the chat and, and I will try to connect with all of you guys um, through LinkedIn or all right, thank you so much and uh, everybody have a great evening. Thank you again, Anna. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you everyone for coming in. And investing thank you so day. much. Thanks.